it's great, great to be here and great to be supported by Daryl, who's been kind of my mentor for years, really. Um, and what brings us both together today is the fact that uh, way back in the spring, we both decided um, on our own, we didn't even chat about it, to develop a society model. And we met up one day and we actually come up with the same thing, pretty much the same thing. So it's a great piece of work by, by both of us. I'm really excited by it and really excited to be presenting. So um, I'm going to quickly run through the agenda, just to talk a little, very quickly about Pansensic and an overview of the model and then straight to the benefits of the model because we don't want you going home too soon. And then we talk about this crisis transition cycle. Um, we then go to where we are now, uh, what's coming next and what we can do. And then there's some questions and answers at the end. But I think this particular slide, it, because it can be a little bit overwhelming when you start looking into the future with the possibilities. Um, yes, uh, the crisis is a dangerous thing. We are in a dangerous place, perhaps but there's also a lot of opportunity there as well. So what I want to leave you with today is the fact that despite what's where we are, despite what's coming down the road, there is opportunity and we're gonna, we want to help you find that opportunity. Okay, so Pansensic's purpose is to help people make wiser decisions so we can live, live in a better world. And, and, and that's what we live by, that's what gets me up in the morning. And we actually achieve this by helping organizations remove frustration and anger from their worlds. So we, we look through their big data text files and we identify places that they can remove frustration. So we actually are achieving our purpose and I feel very proud of that. Um, we're essentially improvers and innovators at heart and uh, six or seven years ago a bunch of us got together and um, pulled our experience to to found, found Pansensic and, and the text analytics company it is today. We have global partners around the world um, but we're in 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 the north of Cornwall a place called Bude it's one of the, the most loveliest places to live and um, I, it's it's fantastic to work as well. So very quickly what we do, we take lots of text data from all sorts of places, internally, externally, on the, on the internet. It's called unstructured text. It's unstructured because nobody knows what's in these, this huge amounts of text. And what we do is we run pansensic technology over it, which is our algorithms and our ontologies, to actually work out what's going on, what's been talked about, what the frustrations are, how we can improve. So that's what Pansensic do. Where do we do it? Well, consumer experience is where we, where we do most of our work, but we also do um, employee experience, patient experience. And more recently, we're moving into two new areas, which is societal analytics, which is what this model is about, but also mental health because um, that the society analytics model, what, what's going to happen to society, we believe there will be an increase in mental health um, problems. And, and, we, and this is part of the opportunity that we've seen uh, in, in, the, in the crisis that we want to help with. Who we do it for? Well, you can see we do it for a lot of companies globally. Um, NHS is one of our biggest customers in the UK, but Accenture is our biggest customer uh, in, in America. Um, so we, we are, um, we have, being a small company, we've got a big footprint print across the world. So the crisis transitions cycle, it's about being forewarned. It's about understanding where we are on this model and, and what's likely to become, to come next. There's two parts to the model. There's the, the bar across the middle, this is four phases. There's the normal world, then we have an impact and then the crisis, there's the disaster, that follows the crisis, the recovery from the disaster, and we're back into the normal world again, but it's a new normal. The black line is, is kind of the, 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 the emotional and the experience journey we are on. And why we've got this line over there is because Pansensic 
contract the various emotions and experiences of a person or a, a, an organization or even a society. Um, and that helps us to understand where we are uh, on this transition cycle. Um, this model has been influenced by many different um, people, other models, um, particularly the Zunin and Myers phases of disaster, but you can't really mention that one because that one was based on the Cuba Ross five stages of grief. So also other influences is Gustav Le Bon, the book, The Crowd, Dimitri Orlov, which is the five stages of collapse, and, and Daryl's books and, and his influence over the years. Um, and many other people have, uh, or many other things have influenced this model as well. So what happens is in the crisis phase, humans struggle to make good rational decisions. Be and, and that's what kicks everything off. It's like a, a, a set of dominoes. Okay, so you can see the Kubler-Ross grief cycle, that wave effect. It's the same as the Zunin and Myers wave effect and the hero's journey as well, which is the flat bit at the top, which is this bit. Then you, uh, and then you, then you go down and along the bottom and up the other side. So it's, it's, it's still that kind of cycle. So, um, and it is very much like a wave. This, this is very much like a wave. And in, in, in North Cornwall, you can't miss the waves. And you know that if a big wave's coming, you know that there's never just one big wave on its own. There's usually a set of waves. This is why the surfers sit out there and they wait for the set. So we know that we're in this particular crisis at the moment. There's likely to be other crises that follow this one because they do come in waves. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, the benefits of the model. Um, first of all, we need to monitor and understand where we are and what is next. And this is what this white line takes us through. We want to mitigate the severity of the dust disaster that follows the crisis. So instead of going all the way down here on the black line, we want to follow a, a, a more shallower the yellow line. We also want to shorten the end to end times. So we don't want to be in the disaster phase any longer than we have to. Um, and at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to use the learning from the disaster and the crisis phases to improve our new, to, or to, to create the new normal. And the, so the best way to predict that new normal is, is to actually create it yourself. Okay, so you will see, uh, as you go through uh, my slides, quotes from various people. And I've put that in there just to help you understand what, it, what the various emotions mean in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so it starts with the impact. And you shortly into these four emotions, excitement, shock, fear, and denial. Um, excitement, shock, fear, fear they, they all have the same impact on us as individuals. We feel it in the same place. Um, and, and in that place, it's extremely difficult to make rational decisions. Equally, denial. Den and probably the, 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 the most beautiful um, quote that I've got in this deck is this one. Denial is a shock absorber for the soul. So this is just, just helping you get through that excitement, shock, fear stage before you, you then need to move on. And it's all part of the, the grief cycle as well. So... Um, very difficult to make decisions in a crisis. What also happens in that crisis is we, we don't really know what's going on. And when in the global financial crisis um, that we've been through a few years ago, um, Paul Samuelson, who was you know, a very experienced economist, said we, we didn't really know what was going on. And it's the same with this crisis. And we, we all know it, we all feel it. Okay, so we then move into, as we go through the crisis, we move into the frustration phase. Um, this is where we, we know things aren't right. We feel it in, 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 in our emotions that it, things are just not as good as they could be. And um, the frustration then leads to um, the emotion to be disillusionment. Um, so um, 
Gustave Le Bon wrote a book in 1895, an extraordinary book which studied the crowd. Um, and basically what happens as we start sliding down this slope into the trough is we get trigger events. And the trigger events can be caused by all sorts of things, but then what tends to happen is people hijack the situation to, for their own ends. Um, and you get, when you get the crowd coming together, the crowd do things that they wouldn't do on their own. Uh, it's contagious. Um, they're very easy to influence by, by the, the demagogues as such. And I'm sure that um, Adolf Hitler must have read that book, The Crowd, because his quote basically says exactly what's going on there. It's a dangerous time when we start to get in this disillusionment because it's very easy to influence people. And, and that's kind of, we're, we're, we're in that space now. Um, these trigger events carry on going through, right the way through the disaster, even into the recovery, they'll, but they'll probably start being smaller. And that takes us to where we are today. And I think that um, based on the model and my observations of society, we're just entering the disaster phase. Society is, is starting to feel angry. And along with anger comes impulsiveness. The two things together are a challenge for, for, for all of us, really. Um, very, again, in that state of mind, extremely difficult to, to make a decision or, or to innovate or improve. So, um, so that's, I'm mean, gonna take you as far as, as explaining the model as we are today, because hopefully we'll have another webinar a bit further along where we can move through the, through the cycle. But essentially we go from anger to feeling society or individually we might feel depressed. Then as we start to accept where we are, we start to actually be um, creative and come up with ideas. Very difficult to come up with ideas uh, when you're frustrated and angry and imp <clears throat> impulsive. Right at the bottom there is, is a breakdown or a breakthrough situation, a big break, a big breakthrough. And following the breakthrough, then we start to um, pull out of the disaster zone into the recovery zone and back into the new normal. So, um, Daryl, I was wondering if you could just talk through the, the innovation um, zones that we go through on this model, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, we spend you most of our time muted. with clients on the innovation story. Daryl, uh, hmm. are, are you muted at the moment? I don't think I am. Um, what's happened there, Andy? Yes. Okay. Uh, people can hear. Chat to say they can hear me. Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah I, I spend most of my life working with companies on the uh, innovation agenda, and we've been saying since uh, 2009 that you know, we're in this crisis period, and uh, uh, it's the time for innovation to happen, um, or rather, we, we the, the real heart of it comes up in the next few months i think so uh, uh we're in the crisis at the moment and you know as the model they're showing is uh, what we've seen is a lot of expedient invention taking place so uh, if you look at the healthcare sector for example classic examples would be uh, there's not enough ppe and so people run around improvising uh, ppe from bin bags and you know, whatever they can find uh, basically um so yeah that's that's the people come together and get very resourceful and, and creative and um yeah it's it's invention rather than innovation uh, i would say um i think when people get past that uh the anger uh, period and they can start thinking rationally again that's when the real innovation period happens it's when people start to realize what the what the frustrations uh, are what the contradictions uh, so again, just sticking with uh, PPE as an example, um, if, you, if you look at you know, uh, clinicians and nursing staff that have come off the end of a 12 hour shift that have, where they've been wearing a mask and you know, their face is full of uh, sores and scars, et cetera, um, you know, that's the sort of opportunity that the innovation people come in and say, okay, well, 
yeah, if we're going to be wearing masks, then at least let's design masks that don't cause people to be uh, uh, scarred and and to have skin problems at the end of it. And so it's that it's that literally that contradiction solving period, uh, that green zone there where the, the innovators in the world have got their biggest opportunities, I would say. Uh, later on, as we start to come out of the crisis, then um, it, consolidation uh, is, um, is, is basically the refinements to those big jumps, uh, if you like. And uh, you know, when things uh, stabilise uh, more, then whoever's survived through the crisis period tends to survive uh, for you know, the, the, the calm period afterwards, which is usually you know, 40, 50 years. Uh, if the cycle is able to repeat itself in the longer term. So the consolidation stuff, uh, so very much about the incremental improvements, very often um, production type improvements. So somebody comes along with a, a new um, yeah, no harm mask, for example, uh, and then somebody else has got to come along and work out how to make that for a few cents rather than several dollars. And um, yeah, that's the thing that then uh, allows the the new incumbent organizations to uh, uh, step in and take over from the the old world uh, players thank you daryl um sorry about earlier on it wasn't you that's was muted it was my speaker <laughs> <laughs> okay so so actually so for far so we're going to go through the model so far just uh, to show you that the model is um, pretty much in line with what's been going on in society so if we take um, way back here in March you know everybody was out there on the doorsteps clapping in the street clap, clapping the heroes and the heroes is uh, in in the phases of disaster is here and it's and it's here and that's what happened in March the he clapping the heroes then um, the next phase in that dis um, disaster model uh, um, is the honeymoon phase. And this is where everybody in society gets together and they, people are, as Daryl pointed out, making PPE out of um, plastic bags, that kind of thing. Um, next comes the expedient innovation bit. And this is where, again, where Daryl was talking about, and this is uh, the Dyson um, ventilator. Um, I'm sure there's a big warehouse full of them somewhere. Um, and then in May, what we saw in May, we started to see um, society getting a bit frustrated. A few um, marches in, in, in London. And what starts to emerge then is the real, what I call the drivers of anarchy, probably because I grew up in the punk era. But it, this is like the rejection of, of policy. So the first emerging driver of anarchy that I saw was the, basically people losing trust in the government. And I think that's still going on. Um, following, uh, sorry, um, in that period, we did do a, a huge, um, sorry, did I miss a bit? Okay, we did a huge piece of um, analysis at Pansensic. We scraped. 133,000 comments across four countries. That's nearly 7 million words from 277 sources. And we were able to see what people were talking about. We were able to see their frustration. So this is not just me plucking it out of thin air. This is actually um, comments that are out there in the public domain. And we um, basically found the, the main topics of conversation in those comments. Um, and we were able to look at what was really frustrating people. So information awareness was the number one. Lockdown, um, governments and politics, all that sort of thing. So that's how we are able to sort of see what's going on in, in, in the public um, arena. So the second emerging driver that I noticed um, was this problem with um, information. Um, people not knowing what to believe, people not trusting the statistics, people not you know, getting their news from social media, from the, the news that, and, and too many of the news sources, fake news, all that kind of thing. Um, and back then we, um, we, were, we were talking about the problem with that is it does tend to lead to the conspiracy theory. 
Um, and you can see here on, on the left here, somebody um, sort of kicking against the 7-7 brigade. So, um, so many organizations across the world uh, are into this fake news. We don't know who to trust anymore and it's becoming more and more of a problem. So then we come into our first trigger event, um, which was uh, um, George Floyd on, the, Floyd on the 25th of May. Um, and you can see the anonymity and the contagion going along in, the, in this right, right here. Most of these people wouldn't set fire to a shop on their own, but get them in a crowd, get emotions whipped up, and, and anything's possible really, if they feel strongly, strongly enough about it, which they obviously do for obvious reasons. Um, but it, it does start to create divides in society, um, some of these events. So um, where are we now? Well, we are at the anger stage, um, and I still think um, this, this um, information is a, a real problem. And if you look at what's happened this week, beginning of the week, uh, the Queen, she actually picked up on it and made a comment about it. You know, trusted, reliable sources of information. So um, where do we go for that these days? Um, I, I know from a personal point of view, um, I used to look at the BBC all the time and I've lost faith in them. So it's very difficult to know who to trust and what to believe these days. And it is a real problem. Um, and it is leading to more conspiracy theories and, uh, you know, banning a conspiracy theory, which happened this morning um, across the world, Facebook and, um, uh, and their platform, various platforms, you know, drives it underground. I think that could be a trigger event. So this is kind of where we are in, in today. Um, so what's next? Well, the book that Dimitri Orlov wrote, Five Stages Collapse, is, I think it's very significant. Um, it can, it's a bit of a depressing read once you get down the bottom here. But at the top here, the first thing is the financial collapse. And it's not difficult to see. Uh, and I think most people on the street just wonder how this, we're going to avoid a financial collapse. And so the depth of this um, of this correlates with, it, with going down through these five stages of collapse and God forbid we don't get, get too far down and, and that we can actually pull out of it. And, um, but the other way of looking at it is maybe, just maybe, we could design a better world at the end of it if we do go through some of this crisis. And I think this is what uh, Orlov's sort of mentions in his book is certainly what Daryl and I believe. Um, so how deep it goes and how long it takes to get out the other side depends on how many of these collapses we go through. And Daryl, I wondered if you'd like to comment on, on, on the, how long this might take and the, the fourth turn in implication. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the fourth turning work is, is definitely playing out. Um, yeah, I think what that tells us is that these trigger events, so I think specifically the arrival of the pandemic, is kind of like the um, Pearl Harbor event or the Germany invades Poland event in Europe. Um, the one that says that society has now jumped off its current S-curve and is looking for its next one. And um, yeah, as Olaf uh, says that yeah, uh, as it's looking for the next one, things inevitably get worse. Uh, when, you, when you jump off the S-curve, you know, things do get uh, worse. It's one of the reasons why most companies don't like innovating because uh, nobody likes it when things get worse. Um, so the um, uh, the the fourth turning model talks about, uh, as you mentioned, dominoes fall, and I think it's uncertain at this point in time how many dominoes uh, fall over. But um, periods of chaos can only endure for so long. Yeah, people can only cope with so much chaos. It's uh, you know, a bit like an uh, extreme weather event. You, you, you don't expect to be in a tsunami for, uh, for days. Um, I think in terms of the societal waves, what we're looking at is you know, the end-to-end -end time is, uh, as far as we can tell at the moment, four to five years. So it, you know, we don't know how many dominoes are going to fall over um, and how badly they're going to fall over. But what we do know is that... Um, you know, these uh, chaos can only prevail for so long. And so you know, what we're basically saying is that you know, 
now till 2024, 25 is the innovation period uh, after which uh, things calm down again. Um, there's a lot of talk of punctuated equilibrium. It's usually called by the um, anthropologists and uh, and so on. Um, and I think yeah, we're in one of those um, periods now where there's a perturbation happening in the system, which becomes several other ones, and then they settle down again and things calm down for uh, according to the model. Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that you know, probably 40 or 50 years. So you survive this period of 2025. And uh, um, if you do that, then you're, you're pretty well set for the next, uh, yeah, the next few decades. Thank you very much. OK, so um, what we do know is that in the crisis phase, the, the UK government spent 250 billion. Um, I would imagine that that 250 billion will be dwarfed by the cost of the longer and the deeper disaster phase. So all that has got to be paid for. Um, and there's all sorts of things that possibly could happen. And in 1967, the government devalued the pound. You know, in the, in, 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 in the um, in beginning of the last century, you know, Germany was pushing money around in, in, a, in a wheelbarrow. So who knows what's coming, but we, what we do know that it, it will take some getting out of, and we will have to find a way to innovate our way out of the crisis. Um, there will be more trigger events along the way, and I, I don't want to do alarm and, and, and worry people, but actually um, then there will be more drivers of anarchy, more frustrations out in the street. But as we get into the disaster phase and the frustrations become clear and the contradictions become clear, that allows us to actually work on something to improve or to innovate with, to get us out of the, of the disaster zone and get us into a recovery. Um, and the model says, you know, from here on in, we don't, it goes down into chaos, but we all know out of chaos comes order. So it is all about this contradiction and frustration solving innovation in this green disaster bit. So as individuals, what we can do is we can look to solve problems, look to solve frustrations, identify them. So if it's a, an organization, um, say a, 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 a company, what are the frustrations of your customers in the current environment? If it was, say, a police force, what are the frustrations in your area? And, and by knowing the frustrations, knowing what's happening, you can find, a, find solutions. And that's what gives you the start to get out of the disaster zone and move on into the recovery. Um, so add, have you got any more to add to that, Adair, or not? Now, now you are muted, Daryl, I think. Sorry. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a good connection, I think, to the question that David's uh, asked on the chat, um, uh, which is, I, I think, the, this idea of um, yeah, uh, how deep does the, the trough go? Um, and I think that's, that's got to be an unknown at the moment. I think you, you talked earlier about, um, as with surfing, sets of waves. And you know, there's a cartoon that, uh, that's going around in this country and has been for a while of you know, there's a covid wave and then behind it is a brexit wave and behind that is a climate change uh, wave if all those things compound then yeah, basically what happens is that you you, you take this uh, this disaster cycle model and you, and you overlay several disasters on it and so the trough gets deeper and deeper um, and the deeper it gets you know, the further down that all of model uh, you showed uh, takes us so yeah, it's uh, if we fall down one level, then um, yeah, it's it's relatively easy to recover from that. But uh, if we yeah, if if we fall down two or three, then uh, um, it's it's going to be a long old slog. Okay, so the the way out of this is to innovate, and and that's going to open up opportunities for a lot of people. It's a great time to innovate, even though it's a worrying time. Um, so um, th that's as far as we're going to take it today. 
Um, we're going to take some feedback from people after this event and to see if there is a follow on one, which we think there will be. But uh, I'd like to hand over to Andy um, now, who's going to. Um, yeah, we've got a, a few questions. A few questions yeah. that we need to answer. Um, so I could start with uh, one here. Um, so the question is, is one of the problems um, that some political leaders um, who will rena rena remain nameless um, seem unable to manage complex thinking? They are applying simple thinking to complex issues. Um, an example, example is Sinefin, which I think is a conceptual decision-making framework. Um, could this push us into the political crisis? And is this necessary? Well, I know Daryl is much closer to the Sinefin um, model than I am. So, Daryl, can you answer that one? I can give it a go. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. I think the um, I, th I think I agree with you. I think yeah, any, any country that's got a populist government is uh, is um, really a government that does not understand complexity at all. Uh, yeah, it, it's trying to identify that simple solution, and uh, simple almost never works in a complex world. And I think what what populism does is it, it basically compounds. Uh, the, the depth of the crisis that you're likely to get into uh, until you know, a, a critical mass of the population sees through the, the simple messages and realises that um, the, there needs to be a different way of doing things. Uh, but I think the, the problem is that uh, we spend a lot of time with uh, looking at complex systems and, and helping companies to measure um, yeah, where they are in terms of a complexity landscape. And I think that the challenge for most organisations, you know, never mind national governments, is that very few people understand complex systems. And so a lot of the things that, that are done as uh, normal things in society just don't apply when, you, when you're in a complex world. So one of the classic ones is um, a root cause analysis. Go and look for the root cause of a problem. Um, but if you're in a complex environment, there is no such thing as a root cause. So what you end up doing is you know, having lots and lots of people devoted to try and find a unicorn that literally doesn't exist uh, instead of actually you know, embracing the complexity and trying to find solutions uh, through it. So I think yeah, in summary to the question, uh, Lucy, I think the, yeah, the, the, there's very little complex thinking going on. I think it's one of the reasons why Dave Snowden and, uh, and Kenevin is, is, is experiencing so much frustration themselves that uh, you know, the, the right people just aren't listening to it because it's just so far away from their view of the world. Um, and so it, I think that populism is, is going to cause things to get uh, significantly more um, uh, trough-like than they needed to have been. Thank you very much, Daryl. Is there any more questions? Um, got w one more. Um, the question is, does the data uh, and your system provide any insight into what can be done to flatten and shorten the disaster recovery trough? I guess help the leaders. With the way of it. So I'll have a go and then maybe Daryl can follow up. So the answer is yes. And um, what we would need to do is we would need to scrape data from from the world that, you know, from whoever was asking that question, from their world or from somebody else's world, to see what the frustrations are, to see what the, the desires of that cohort of the population are. Um, it's all about um, finding a relevant um, body of people and, and, and finding out where they comment, where they talk and analyzing what they're saying. So yes, we can do that. And very likely that's what the follow up to this particular um, webinar will be about. So we will be looking to try and find examples of where we can find frustrations and contradictions to solve, to help people mitigate the, the depth and, and shorten the length of this uh, disaster period. Daryl, have you got anything to add more to that? Uh, yeah, I think it's a it's a really tricky one. I think the you know, you, again you mentioned the Olaf book, which talks about you know, five levels of bad scenario. Uh, what I tried to do in the Everything book was to say, okay, well there there is a sixth scenario, which is a good one, uh, which is that you know, society breaks through and and hits a higher level. So in in previous um, you know, meta cycles, so that, that 
the reason that we're all talking a lot about the 1930s and, and the Second World War at the moment is because you know, we're, we're in the, the equivalent to that uh, period in the, the cycle history uh, right now. Um, you know, if you look at America at the end of that cycle, so society jumps off an S-curve with Pearl Harbor and finds a new S-curve. You know, America came out of the Second World War extremely well. Um, the previous cycle before that was the, uh, um, the Civil War in America. Um, and America didn't come out of that quite so well. Um, you go back to the previous cycle and you know, it's the War of Independence. And America, again, came out of that really well. So um, there's no rule that says you come out of these things well or badly. Um, I think it does depend a lot on the political leaders that you've got in place. Um, uh, but you know, at the same time, uh, there's no doubt that um, uh, real change only happens in chaos. And so you know, I think as the, as the crisis inevitably deepens, as the model you know, there is showing, you know, at, at some point, I think uh, um, people's mind kicks into uh, a view that says, OK, well, you know, my current world doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. I've got nothing to lose anymore. And so I'm going to you know, make a shift and I'm going to do something. Now I'm going to um, you know, help move things in the right direction. Uh, but it requires a critical mass of people to do that. And you know, again, I think people living in country, countries with populist governments, it's going to be pretty tough to do that because there's, you know, there's a big tide you're fighting. Okay, okay. Um, another question, well, being re-asked because I missed it uh, from David, my apologies, David. How can pansensic analyze and measure denial with text data? What indications are you looking for? Um, it's, it's a combination of, of, of words that people say where they're, when they're in that space, but it's, uh, it's also a case of reading between the lines. So we have um, um, many different lenses that read between the lines, metaphors that people use. Um, for instance, is, is a great one, um, but also the mindset of the people, uh, their, their archetype. And we have something like uh, 80 psychometrics that we, that we use to, um, to basically understand the various different emotions. So denial is, is, is simply another, emo another emotion. Um, metaphors is a great one, I think, because we, we, we tend to speak in metaphors. And that, that's how, that's how we, we would measure the, the denial. Okay. Okay. And I think this is very inter interesting to mention because of our work with the NHS. Lucy said, uh, um, thanks, this is what I'm seeing in the solutions with clients, particularly in the NHS. Initial approach was crisis management, but now pushback as people are getting tired of command and control. I think that's really interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, I think I, one of the things that we said in Trend DNA is that command and control uh, is completely incompatible with, a, with complex systems and society is a complex system. And so I think yeah, command and control organizations are, are really going to struggle um, you know, during the crisis period, but also afterwards, uh, I think it becomes a, a case of uh, having to embrace the complexity. And I think if you look at some other companies that are already making the shift, uh, you know, my favorite one at the moment, that, uh, I'm boring people with is, is higher that the uh, Chinese white goods manufacturer um, that's I, I think you know, really moved away from uh, the command and control model into one which is you know, so it's an organization with 80,000 employees that are effectively now in 4,000 micro enterprises within the overall company so you've got basically teams of 10 15 people working together as profit centers within this this overall uh, system called uh, called higher I think you know there's an organization that understands it and I think if we're trying to be optimistic about you know coming out of this crisis uh, those organizations that successfully escape from command and control uh, will be the ones that do best um, Daryl would you say that's the same with the government uh, I think so yeah I I, I, uh, I do I think again it goes against the whole populist um, idea and you know, I think what we're seeing in this country is uh, um, Bojo the clown more and more uh, saying you know uh, let me step in and look after this so it's you know, everything migrates to the top and it's the exact opposite of, uh, of what's actually required 
Um, and I think you know, the, the way out of that is that um, it becomes much more about local communities. So you know, we live in the middle of nowhere next to a village with about 100 people in it. And it, it's been uh, really heartwarming, I would say, during this pandemic, how people in that small community have pulled together. Um, and I think you know, that's where you see an, a complete absence of command and control. It's, it's, it's all about network and it's all about cooperation with other people. Um, but I think it's it, those kind of things inevitably start at a local level. Um, and yeah, in that sense, government kind of becomes an irrelevance. Great, thank you. Is that it? Right, that's, that's everyone's questions. Um, so I think wrap things up. Okay, well, I'd just like to say thank you for everybody that's turned up today. Um, it, fortune favours the brave and, you know, to look at some of this stuff, you, you have to be brave. Um, there is lots to look forward to. There's lots of opportunities here. Um, and, you know, if we can manage our emotions better, we can get through it better. So I'd just like to say thank you for everybody and a big thank you for Daryl um, for joining me and supporting me today. Yeah, and for Andy to for, to, um, to to chair it. Um, if anybody would like to contact us after the event, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, also, if anybody would uh, like to read more into Daryl's fantastic works, um, system systematicinnovation.com. Um, I'm sure he'd be delighted to sell a few books. So <laughs> there's, a plug, there's your plug for you, Daryl. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to yeah, just sign off and say thank you very much. And uh, I hope to um, do another webinar in the not too distant future and, and, and meet you all again. Thank you. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank thanks, everyone. And I can see Gary's question there. Gary, if you're still